Good evening and a very warm welcome to you all tonight. My name is Jacqueline Collier. I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor for Social Sciences here at the University of East Anglia. It's my great pleasure to be introducing <laughs> Professor Mark Zaytoun tonight. Mark has followed an unconventional path to get here, joining UEA and DEV nine years ago last month, which he says he means he's been in Norwich three times longer than any other place he has lived since he left home when he was 19 years old and flew the nest from Ottawa. Then he went to Montreal to study civil engineering at McGill. And following a year in between studying structural engineering in Strasbourg, Mark graduated in 1990 with a zeal infused by his professors to pour some concrete. And this he did, working in construction project management for several years in Canada, France, and Lebanon. But it was in Lebanon that his focus started to blur when the concrete got confused by real people. Whilst undertaking an MSc back at McGill, in environmental engineering this time, he founded a small NGO called CEPL, the Canadian Educational Exchange with Palestinians. The experience with people displaced and distraught with war led him to start work with the International Committee of the Red Cross and other humanitarian agencies in 1999. Living for several years in Congo, Iraq, the West Bank and Gaza, his task was to supply clean-ish water to people immediately after or right in the middle of the fighting. This meant setting up refugee camps in Brazzaville, rehabilitating hospitals in Basra and negotiating water pipes through checkpoints in Janine. The latter whilst reading Tony Allen's The Middle East Water Question in between his evening beers. Fed up with mopping up other people's messes, he left for London, where his fiancée, Samia, had just started a job. Mark marched into Tony's office in King's College, London, to tell him how little he really knew about water in the Middle East, but left two hours later with his tail between his legs and a great passion to study the issue in much more detail. The PhD under Tony's supervision set him firmly on the path that he remains on until this day. He was doubly fortunate to be under Tony's wing during his period and work with extremely synergistic and creative scholars at the London Water Research Group, as well as a team of world-class professionals assisting the Palestine, Palestine Liberation Organization in their water negotiations with Israel, known as the Water Team, and led by Dr. David Phillips. Following a postdoc at LSE, Mark hit his academic stride at UEA. With Bruce Langford and Declan Conway, he co-founded the Water Security Research Centre, the Water Security Short Course, and the Water Security MSc. He continues to pioneer conceptual thinking on the role that power plays in determining the outcome of water conflicts, known as hydrohegemony. He has also developed a research methodology called Hydropolitical Baselines, that combines deep exploration of archives, earth observation, and interviews to provide the basis for diplomats or activists to transform water conflicts. And he applied this for the Ibrahim Ab El Al Foundation and Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation. He's returned to work with the International Committee for the Red Cross, but this time getting his hands much less dirty working with a very sharp team of engineers studying the impact of war on water systems, the subsequent impact on people's health and implications for international humanitarian law. Mark has written dozens of media articles and journal articles. He sits on the board of two journals and is in the middle of his second book. He still convenes the MSc and remains inspired by the fresh perspective and optimism that the students bring to his what he describes as now cynical self. Tonight he's going to share his thoughts with us about water, war and so much more. So please join me now in welcoming Professor Mark Zaytoun to give his inaugural lecture.
Oh, it's amazing how a summary of anything can make it sound so neat and tidy. <laughs> My journey to this point here tonight could have just as easily, easily been described in a number of missteps and good fortune. But that's what stories do, right? They eliminate the fuzziness. My own research story that I'm going to share with you tonight will surely sound a lot more joined up than it actually is. It's, allow me to indulge me as I cover my history, motivations, goals, and all the people that I've worked with and all the people who support me in this. The story covers several journeys, in fact. The first is from engineer to social scientist, or ontologically from positivist to critical realist. Emerging from my background of civil engineering, all I wanted to do with rivers was dam them, like this dam, or build bridges over them. But now I question bridges and dams and why we build them so much that I, all I want to do with rivers now is paddle down them. And the second journey is from optimistic youth to crusty curmudgeon. And it's customary at inaugural lectures to show embarrassing photos of the glory days, so here you go, let's get it over with quickly. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. Look at the youth. Look at the optimism. Look at the fashion. <laughs> Look at the happy expressions. Those of you who are still sniggering, I'll have you know that 35 pounds, that's the figure that I've saved on shampoo ever since I've been <laughs> 27 years old. So last laugh. Allow me also to pepper this talk with a bunch of water metaphors and saying, and my shout to the person who picks up the right number at the very end. And here's the very first one. You can't step into the same river twice. You can't step into the same river twice, the saying goes, because it's not the same river and you're not the same person. I really like how that captures the constant change that we're all living through, the instability that we're forced with. Somewhat like this diagram here, which was left by the lecturer before me. Constant instability. Oh, and by the way, all the photos here are my own, unless they're of myself. So please don't think that I've lifted them if they're not attributed. OK, now the story of my research. Nice and tidy. At the broadest level, I hope that my work restores some water's nourishing essence. This comes from the years spent mopping up the messes of power-hungry people, as Jackie was saying. For instance, in the Republic of Congo, Congo Brazzaville, where the so-called internally displaced people, to give them a dehumanizing label, people displaced from their villages into the city and occupying or living in a university much about the same size as UEA. They had no water at all, and our response was quite simple. Get, find some clean water, find some water, put some chlorine into it, pump it into some bladders, and then distribute it. Or in the West Bank and Gaza, different type of conflict here, military and political occupation of the land. Lots of damaged water pipes and lots of restricted access, repair crews who can't get out to fix the, the damaged water pipes. The short-term response here, the Band-Aid, is to deliver pipes and to negotiate access with the military or the political authorities. Did quite a bit of that. Or in Eastern Chad, another dehumanizing label, refugees from Darfur. So people from Darfur who had been displaced by, by the fighting in Darfur now coming and living in the, local, uh, on, in the land that the local people were living in. Same tribes, different nationalities. Not a lot of water around in the first place and very poor quality as well. So we dug wells and we drilled boreholes and we pumped it up to bladders and we distributed it. We're in Lebanon, 2006, a short, well, the 33-day war, which damaged dozens of public water reservoirs. And so the immediate response was building temporary rocks, reservoirs, these so-called Oxfam tanks. So low-tech engineering, logistical nightmares to do this kind of work. And it's all about water. At its essence, water keeps us alive. It keeps us healthy 
by allowing us to wash or whisking away our sewage. It sustains our growth by producing food. It sustains and nourishes our souls by producing, well, by giving the natural world that we get so inspired by. And my favorite is that it mocks static political borders, reminding us about how ephemeral the borders are. Water flows under the borders, and aquifers over the borders in rivers, or across the borders in clouds. But as we've seen, conflict, that is to say people, can interrupt the water supply, can spoil the water quality, and can use water to harm others. We also have a great ability to turn water into an, another reason to fight. And so we're robbing water of its nourishing essence. So again, at the broadest level, I hope that my work helps a little bit to restore water to its nourishing essence. More specifically, I hope that my work on water and conflict means that there is less water conflict when my son, my six-year-old son is 50, than there is right now because there's a lot, about, a lot of it about. The engineer comes social scientist that I am, I use a, a concept that keeps running through my brain is how all water conflict is a result of social and biophysical processes. So social processes like people who choose to deny water to other people, and biophysical processes, the natural variability in the weather and the climate, or the anthropocentric climate change, of course. And my research can be broadly framed in two categories then. One is how water influences conflict, more or less as a source of conflict, or how conflict affects water as a victim or tool of conflict. So I'll go through those two broad categories now. So under the first category, topics that I research include water security, water justice, transboundary water conflicts, and analysis for diplomacy. I'll focus on the last two. And my motivation here is the grossly unfair sharing of water between states that I see around the world. I'm also not very impressed by the mainstream, did you catch that one? Mainstream analysis that isn't critical enough. It seems to paper over a lot of the hidden power dimensions to the, to the conflicts. And I'm really deeply unimpressed by the diplomats and activists that seek to manage conflict rather than to undertake the much longer viewed and difficult work of trying to resolve or transform the conflict. So lots of rivers. I tend to focus on these three, the Nile River, the Jordan, and the Tigris and Euphrates. This is the longest river in the world. It flows northwards from Lake Victoria, which is a funny name for a lake in the middle of Africa, but there you go. And from Lake Tana in Ethiopia, down through Sudan and into Egypt, emptying into the Mediterranean. When I started my PhD, Egypt had control over 85% of these flows and Sudan had control over the rest, leaving precisely zero for all the rest of the states, including for Ethiopia, where roughly 80% of the Nile measured at the Sudan-Egypt border falls as rain. And here's one of the shortest international rivers in the world. Israel had control of 90% of the transboundary flows of the river and of the transboundary aquifers, so the, the, rock, the groundwater in the rock structures underneath the soil, leaving the Palestinians uh, to build their state with one drop out of every 10 of rain. I personally think it's outrageous that one state can take 80 or 90% of a river that is meant to be shared, and that we don't even usually hear about it so much, or that I hadn't known about it. So I began to wonder how that control had been achieved. And I sort of assumed that it just fell to whoever was upstream or downstream. Well, that's when I read in Tony's book on page 224, a real watershed moment for me, when he compared which country controlled the flows in each of the three rivers. And his portrayal revealed that states could control the flows from any riparian position, that's whether you're upstream, midstream, or downstream. So Israel being midstream, Egypt being downstream, remember the river flows north, 
and Turkey upstream. And he suggested that hegemonic power was the reason for this. Now power, to a civil engineer, is as clear as spring water. It's simply the amount of work done over a specific distance. You can measure it. But the power of one state to determine an outcome over a shared resource is quite another thing. You need really different type of brain, different sort of tools to measure it. It's about military and political power, for sure, economic power, but, and certainly political power. Who's got your back? But not being defeatist or determinist, However, you realize that the so-called weaker side is not always as weak, as powerless, as a narrow-minded realist might, might suggest. And this is the bargaining power that comes from being a legitimate actor in a relationship. The power that your boss has over you by way of contract. The power, of a house, the power that a house cat has over its so-called master. Or the power of some small island states at the UN General Assembly, arguably but certainly it's the primary source and perhaps the only source of power for the Iraqis, Ethiopians, and Palestinians in their transboundary water negotiations with their riparian neighbors. But that still doesn't explain the whole picture, the deep feelings, the framings, the things that aren't questioned. Like the saying of the Greek historian Herodotus, Egypt is the Nile and the Nile is Egypt. I'd heard that. Many of my Egyptian friends had repeated it to me. But it wasn't until I met my first Ethiopian friend that I realized, and well, he, when he pointed out to me that Egypt may be the Nile, but the Nile is actually 11 other states, thank you very much, not least of which is Ethiopia. Yet I hadn't realized that until someone from the weaker, so-called weaker state drew it to my attention. Or consider the 2000, <coughs> pardon me, or consider the 2006 Israeli-American solution for the people in the West Bank for water, which was to desalinate on the coast, on the, so on the West Coast, and deliver water east up into the mountains of the West Bank, whilst taking water from underneath the people in the West Bank and pumping it westwards. Power, looking at the balance of power alone couldn't explain why the Palestinian decision makers agreed in principle to this West-East transfer. And so you have to take it a step further. And here you realize that people like Edward Said or Aimé Césaire or Franz Fanon or Steve Beagle were right when they were talking about subservience or about the most powerful weapon of the oppressor is the, in the hands of the oppressor is the minds of the oppressed. And you take note of how each of these great thinkers paid tribute to Antonio Gramsci. And so you reach for his understanding of hegemony to help interpret the outcomes of consent to an arrangement. That's a key word, consent. And you learn how narratives that you acquire or that are forced onto you by your parents or by your school when you're little, you know, total allegiance to your, to your nation or to your religion, for example, you learn what they say about to, well, you learn how they help to frame your worldview or to narrow and restrict your worldview more, more accurately. And you begin to see, and this, remember, I was a positivist, you see how knowledge is constructed, not objective, and that no amount of knowledge will ever replace deep feelings, a juggernaut of emotion overwhelming the rationality of science, as the saying goes. And suddenly, you're as far as you could possibly be from the engineering definition of power. So I was really thrown into the deep end with all this theory. And I had to reach for the help of the London Water Research Group, specifically Jeroen Warner and the, and the rest of these incredible scholars. But control over water is not a metaphysical or abstract issue in any way. The ability to exploit the river still matters to a very large degree. I mean, you can't control a river if you don't have enough money to build the infrastructure. And having the upstream position really is an advantage. But taking it a little bit further still, you can identify the very different forms of power that are employed tactically, and in some cases strategically, to advance goals of achieving or of consolidating control. 
So these two figures form the basis of the analytical framework of hydrohegemony, which is now quite widely cited in the li research literature. And from very humble beginnings when I kickstarted them in 2006, I'm proud that the eighth international workshop attracted over 100 people and was run by two of my students actually, Steph Hawkins and Rebecca Farnham. Looking back at them now, I see that they're such simple shapes, they remind me of my son's building blocks. It's like trying to explain thought control through Lego. But you'll soon see when I show you a few more diagrams how, how much complicated, how complicated my other figures have become and how much less effective. Okay, so the work of the London Water Research Group flowed onwards and morphed into what I call now critical transboundary water interaction, the subject of a book that I'm co-authoring right now with Yeroon and Naho Miramachi, and also the subject of the series of papers in international environmental agreements. The first step in this critical transboundary water interaction is reconsidering what cooperation is. This was necessary because the bulk of the research literature and policy documents were kept calling for cooperation over water, but they never defined it. And in not defining it, they ended up producing or reproducing the state of hegemonic control that existed before they even began their work. So they weren't changing anything, they were just consolidating things by not defining co cooperation. The major conceptual leap here came from Naho Miramachi and her transboundary water interaction nexus. This matrix allows you to plot interstate relations between states on a matrix of intensifying cooperation on the x-axis or intensifying conflict on the y-axis. Up until this point, all we had, the only analytical tool that transboundary water people had was a continuum that put conflict at one end and cooperation at the other end. And Naho's work was brilliant because she realized that cooperation and conflict coexist. Anybody who's been in a relationship with anyone else knows that. You can be resolving some issues while fighting over others. You can be bickering with each other as you go to pick up groceries. So I've heard. <laughs> we don't bicker at all, my wife and I. And the tool also allows you to explain how technicians on opposite sides of a, con of a conflict can actually coordinate to measure well depth as their political masters engage in a war of words, as on the Tigris and Euphrates. So you have cooperation and conflict happening at the same time at different levels. And the tool further reveals how some actors can use that fact to present a face of cooperation or of conflict to any intermediaries that try to intervene, like the Roman-faced god Janus. And the tool further draws attention to the fact that some forms of conflict are okay, in the sense that they bring issues to the table. But much more interestingly, I think, that some forms of what people call cooperation can be destructive. Like the prison guard who's whipping his prisoner for information and telling him to cooperate, cooperate. If the cooperation is done on the terms of the hegemon, then there, you know that there's much more to the consent than meets the eye. And that means you have to research that consent, no matter how difficult it is to research it. And it is quite tricky. But this explains, for example, why some woolly environmental NGOs in Palestine and Israel can actually do more damage than good, perhaps unwittingly, by suggesting that the little bit of cooperation that goes on at the village level, for example, is actually meaningful at the, at the larger political level. And they remain blissfully unaware of the fact that it diverts attention away from the root causes of the conflict, which helps to explain why I hadn't even heard of the Nile conflict or of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict before I went to Palestine for the first time. So the second step in the critical transboundary water interaction is about counter hegemony. And this work was led by Anna Kaskow. With an eye on the Nile, Anna understood that any hydrohegemonic arrangement was based on the consent of the so-called weaker side, 
but that not all consent is or was equal. I.e., some consent could be veiled or strategic, as Ethiopian coordination with Egypt at the Nile Basin in, during the Nile Basin Initiative, following years of threats from Cairo to Addis Ababa. And you begin to realize how transboundary water arrangements are always a mixture of coexisting consent and compliance, uh, consent and contest. And then you map out a bunch of cases and figure out much more precisely how water conflicts change and how they can change. And this is through the elaboration of an alternative vision first, followed by the construction of alternative narratives and alternatives no alternative knowledge. It's basic theory of change applied to transboundary water conflicts. I think it's really exciting because we're putting together something new. We're moving beyond just criticism and beyond just analysis to offer something that's useful to activists and diplomats who are serious about wanting to change slash improve things. But you'll notice that the figures are not getting any easier to get your heads around. Okay, another area of research is my analysis for diplomacy. And as much as I love theory, and I really do love theory, I also really like engaging with the rest of the world and would like my work to improve things. I think this impulse was heightened whilst working with the, the Palestinian negotiations team in their water negotiations with Israel from 2003 to 2010. This, this was the highest octane and most interdisciplinary team that I've ever worked with. Included Shadad Atili, who is a hydrogeologist, lawyers Stephen McCaffrey and Fouad Bate, negotiations expert John Murray, and engineer Michael Talhami. But it was led by the biologist Dave Phillips that Jackie mentioned here in the bottom center. Dave was not only the greatest strategic thinker that I've met, but also one of the most meticulous and rigorous researchers. May he rest in peace. He hired me to undertake three study for the negotiations team, and I was sent to explore the archives at the Royal Geographic Society and the Public Records Office at Kew, something I'd never done before. And I combined this with land use maps and GIS tools and interviews with decision makers. And very directly, these reports form part of the official Palestinian strategy in their negotiations. It informed the Palestinian position in their official negotiations with Israel. And the position itself was based on the principles of international water law. So this was research directly into policy. Quite fun. The negotiations went nowhere, unfortunately. And though the reports remain confidential, I borrowed and developed the method when undertaking the hydropolitical baselines that Jackie mentioned. One with the support of the Ibrahim Abdelal Foundation and one with the support of the Swiss Development and Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation, SDC. So with equally, equally great teams in the form of Shadi Abdullah and Mona Dejani and several others, this work has been able to determine the extent to which the present is shaped by the past. With the understanding that if the future is to be any better, then the patterns are going to have to be disrupted. So it's back to the archives again, but this time in, also in Nantes, in Jerusalem, Beirut, Damascus, multiple languages with a multilinguistic team, and a close examination of the infrastructure. Even sexier remote sensing and satellite imagery analysis, and always the founding of any policy recommend recommendations on the principles of international water law. This work brings me into constant contact with water lawyers and very big thinkers like Steve McCaffrey. Take this opportunity to thank them for their patience with the engineer comes social scientist trying to be a jurist and for their patience for with my telling lawyer jokes. Remind me to tell you during the Q&A what the difference between a sturgeon and a lawyer. And I think that's somewhat less than totally subconsciously, we're applying the theory of counter hydrohegemony when we're undertaking this work. Okay, and now the second 
grand, grand category of my research, which is the impact of water on conflict. So I returned back to the engineering world in 2011, notably to work with the Water Department of the International Committee of the Red Cross, the ICRC, to explore how water is either a tool or a victim of war. And my motivation here is quite simply to slow down the people who destroy water systems or resources, as well as the people who provide the legal or political cover for those who destroy the water systems or resources. And this ICRC, this ICRC team here, named here, is one enlightened group of engineers, grounded by decades of work with nasty people, where an awareness of framing and ideology is as useful a tool of the trade as a pipe wrench or a roll of duct tape. We routinely blend terms like hydraulic pumping capacity, narratives, and what proportionality and precaution in attack means. They asked me to undertake a literature review of how urban public services are, are affected by protracted armed conflict, focusing on Iraq and Gaza. So I reached for my hardest working water security MSc students at the time and we produced this report with the ICRC and two follow-on papers. This work reminded me of the risks that so many municipal water workers take for getting clean water to people. These are the unsung heroes as they fix the mostly hidden and underground systems that allow us to continue to draw water from our taps without questioning where it comes from. And the analysis breaks down the water systems into three components, people, hardware, and consumables, with people being by far the most important. We found just how remarkable, remarkably resilient the systems are, incredibly resilient. It takes several attacks over a sustained period of time to beat the municipal workers. This is a theory that came from the interviews, and here's a more detailed case of Basra. And it showed us that protracted conflict and sanctions, so long-term conflict or long-term economic sanctions, can properly, can properly debilitate a water system, despite its resilience. We could recover from one attack to three, four attacks, but not 15 attacks, not 20 attacks, not over decades. And certainly not when all the maintenance, admin, or engineering teams have fled the country. It's very difficult, almost impossible, to reverse the effects of brain drain. So the longer conflict goes on, the, the more difficult it's going to be, or more, and be more difficult it is to return to any sort of pre-conflict baseline. And the damages extend, of course, beyond the simple water, water system, because the water system is connected to all the other public services, electrical services, health services, food delivery services, and production services. And we've identified, we've identified that there is a point at which it makes no sense to try to restore the service, and hope of all maintenance and proactive planning fades away. And so, one of the implications being that the, the theory of moving from relief into rehabilitation and then into development just doesn't wash with protracted conflicts. It's not the right model, but it's the only model in our brain. We're trying to implement, we're trying to insert other models in people's brains because of this. And apart from war's impact on the psycholo psychology of children, which may be the most harmful effect of war of all, the effect on water systems, I think, should make us all pause and think before we're so quick to invade or impose sanctions on other countries. So that's protracted conflicts. There's also some scope for improvement of the effect of more immediate attacks or of ex the use of explosive weapons. But considering further how different types of attacks affect different parts of the system, we can begin to classify the importance of the system. Here we use the terms downstream, midstream, and upstream, because we're water freaks. And the way that the effects of explosive weapons reverberate physically as well as metaphorically down the pipelines. The ICRC is now doing even more relevant work to identify which parts of a water system are visible from regular earth observation techniques. And so doing, we're working out the reasonably foreseeable consequences of attacks and therefore violations of international humanitarian law. 
IHL is the, also known as the Geneva Conventions or the rules of war. The rules that say you're allowed to shoot someone in the chest, but you're not allowed to gouge their eye out with a spoon. So the rules of war. And the rules of war say that you're allowed to do some damage as long as it wasn't reasonably foreseeable. So you can take out a water treatment plant if, if it wasn't reasonably foreseeable. Now, if we can show that you can identify water treatment plants by their circular forms, mostly for the clarifiers, then you can show that the treatment plant is, the, and you know what the consequences are because there are direct and rever reverberating effects, then the effects of such an attack are reasonably foreseeable and could be, therefore, a violation of international humanitarian law. Of course, IHL doesn't, not every state respects international law, but I think it's a step in the right direction. And some crackerjack lawyers are on the case, as it were. But don't get me started on the lawyer jokes. Okay, the future. Now, with the objective of restoring water's nourishing essence, I'm going to continue to enjoy my teaching. I'm going to continue to relish my admin duties. And I'm going to continue my research on water security, water justice, and transboundary water conflicts. But I really want to get below the state into the subnational level, the very influential NGOs, uh, religious groups, and educators, the influence that they have on international decisions. I'm also keen to undertake more, undertake more baseline studies, but I want to get more engaged. And I'm in, currently in discussion with the SDC to, do, to get involved in such engagement on the Yarmouk River. New work that I'm intending to get into is the impact, how the impact of war on water systems affects people's health. And with Paul Hunter and Joe Gear and Mike Vanderess, uh, we're, we're determined to get one of our proposals accepted sooner or later. You're all welcome on this research agenda. We need a lot more research. We need research on coping mechanisms, how people cope with water during a war. Because some of the coping mechanisms are ingenious and some of them are dangerous. Installing a household water a household booster pump, for example, so at your household, to suck the water from the, the main pipe that's provided by the municipality because the, because the pressure is low. You suck it up into your house, you have some water, but you might be sucking up the contaminated soil around it and therefore poisoning your children. You might also be taking water away from people who are further down the pipe that might need it more than you. But it's every person for themselves at that point. So I think there has to be a lot more water a lot more research into positive and negative coping mechanisms. I'd also like to see more epistep epistemical inquiry of how destruction of water systems might feed back into the conflict that created it in the first place, like a self-perpetuated circle of needless dis destruction. Because there are still too many determinists grabbing the headlines and confusing things, confusing our understanding of water conflicts. So robust analysis in this regard would certainly help the victims of conflict quite a bit. I think we need some different approaches. We need more optimistically critical thinking, analysis that is as sharp as attack and rests on observation, on observation rather than on hopes. So that's Gramsci's saying of pessimism of the will, no, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. We need more deep studies of cases that can only come through PhD students. Academics never have the time to do deep case studies anymore. And we need research that I think, I'll make the case, that, it's norm that is normatively grounded in international law. In the abs with all the imperfections of international law acknowledged and in the absence of a less subjective measure. We need more humanities, the kind of work that Roger Few does literature, art, poetry. I know that there can be more truth in a sonnet by Shakespeare or a verse by Leonard Cohen than an entire volume of academic journal articles. But how do you 
prove that? How do you convince people of that? And we need more engagement, all the while ensuring ring fencing a lot of sky, a lot of space for blue skies thinking and theory development. So if you're with me on this, we've got to remember that this is not conventional in any way. We're swimming against the mainstream, and you've got to let the attacks and metaphorical mud that are coming at us roll off us, like water off a duck's back. Okay, now just before our drink, two more reasons to love water. And thanks, thanks to Jackie and the faculty and thanks to all the colleagues who have helped me through this, particularly all the staff in Dev and DevCo, who are too, num too numerous to, to mention individually. I've never worked in a more collegial atmosphere where people look out for each other, cover each other's lectures, sort problems and differences through without getting their knickers in a twist, and furthermore, offer the stimulation that keeps one fresh. That's a stimulation that recharges me the way that rain recharges an aquifer. And I hope that some of this spills forth to the students. But a particular shout out to Bruce, to Steve Russell, and to John McDonough for their excellent stewardship of Dev through, through very troubled waters. Enormous gratitude also to my family, especially my father and my brothers, my cousins and uncles and aunts for constant support and for bringing me back down to the ground. And special thanks to Samia for keeping me grounded whilst encouraging me to go higher, and for agreeing to visit wells and water treatment plants whilst on vacation. <laughs> so I hope you can join she and I for a drink in the grad bar after the reception, but I'll be happy to field some questions before then. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. On behalf of everybody here, I'd like to give a heartfelt thanks for a stimulating and very powerful talk. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, you're open for questions. Um, I don't know if anyone's going to ask the Sturgeon question, but anyway, we'll, we'll see where we get with that one. So would you like to, me to direct the questions, or do you want to take the questions? I can field them if not? it's easier, yeah. Well, sure. I, I have a feeling that I would be super, uh, surplus to requirements at the moment. So <laughs> thanks. That was evidently as clear as vodka to you all. So a question here, please. Um, do you ever study the effects of permafrost in the water? Um, something I've heard about um, in a organizing a workshop on climate wars, um, the idea being that when the climate sort of flips, hence stable weather on an if, um, you know, we get massive levels of water, food shortages, wars everywhere. Right. The, I mean, the short answer is no, but the, the longer answer is I think permaculture and any sort of alternative technology like that holds great potential for every type of, for, and it should be done for every reason. Um, I haven't thought about how it might help people during war systems and how permaculture systems might be damaged, um, but I imagine there's an issue of scale relevant to there. How much water can you produce through perm permaculture systems? And, how clean can you get it? But certainly something to look into, absolutely. I think it's great to think outside the box. So we've got Bruce, Ada, and then down here. I'll take three questions, please. Great, thank you. <laughs> Great, okay. And the third, second question. When it comes to the uh, 
water supply on the West Bank. Would it be possible to take water from uh, Lake Tiberias, otherwise known as Lake Galilee, and supply more water from there? Okay. So the first question was about whether I'm suspicious or I think whether a political activity over water can affect, at the local level, can affect at the national level? Uh, right. In fact, it can have the opposite direction and doesn't resolve state level. So, in certain cases, it can, but <clears throat> I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I, uh, you know, any sort of local cooperation over water issues is to be welcomed, first and foremost, because it might help those people get a more secure supply, better water quality. So you cannot possibly be against any sort of local cooperation. But I think as analysts, we have to be, you know, stay focused on the, on the political conflict. And to what degree does this local form of cooperation grab headlines? And it does certainly in Palestine and Israel, which is fine because it's a good thing. But what, to what degree does that divert attention away from the political conflict, which is about the distribution of the flows, which remains 90% in favor of Israel, 10%, 10 one drop in every 10 for the Palestinians. And so that was my caution, was against it. But I'd certainly like to explore how, and theoretically, sub, you know, sub subnational cooperation could affect national decision making. Typically, the politicians in the capital don't have too much respect for the people in the hinterlands, is what I found, at least where I work in the Middle East. And sorry, the question was about Lake Tiberias. Could water be taken out of Lake Tiberias? Yeah, yeah. it's a very, very big lake, if I understand. Yeah, in fact, it's a, a, a source of one-third of the supply of uh, Israel's drinking water to this day. It was dammed in 1964 and it's pumped, the water is pumped up through the national water carrier and distributed to demand centers on the coast in Haifa, Akka, and into the desert. So it is a big source of water supply for, for Israel. The other four states that are privy to it, Jordan, Syria, um, Lebanon, and, and the Palestinians, have no access to the, the Lake of Tiberias whatsoever. I wrote a book about it, if, if you <laughs> wish. And I could go on, if you would like. <laughs> Peter? <laughs> so the difference between a sturgeon and a lawyer. Well, one is a slimy, bottom-feeding, scum-sucking amphibian, and the other is a type of fish. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Okay. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, with regard to the number of water puns, I got to ten, but can I double count Main Spring? Because you said that one twice. There you go. It's my shout. I'll buy you a beer. Well, there you go. <laughs> so, again, thank you for a fabulous talk. So knowledgeable, so important, and I think you know from the from all of us here. Thank you and well done. Pleasure. Thank you.